Welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a 501c3 research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss interesting facts about each species. This is our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy the series and be sure to follow us on Instagram to vote for which animal we talk about next. And without further ado, Welcome to the Pac Man podcast. I'm Cindy. And I'm Ken. And so this this week's kind of fun. Okay, so last Marine Mammal highlight, you guys didn't get to choose because it, Instagram was broken for me and it wouldn't let me do it. This time I did the poll and I was like, great, it worked. And then I went to go look at the results and the poll wasn't there. And so I was like, did the poll even go out? I don't know. What happened? Um, I guess I'll make another one. So I made another poll. <laughs> and then when I went to go check that one, both the polls were there. So I apologize for making you guys choose twice. But what was super fun is that it was a landslide both times. It was like 80, like 85% and 90%, something ridiculous. Um, like 25 votes to two uh for the the Galapagos. I almost said the wrong one. Galapagos <laughs> We'll, we'll talk about why it's easy to mis, misdo the names there. Um, but the uh, the Galapagos fur seal beat the Galapagos sea lion of the Battle of the Galapagos Seas. So, um, so that that is my dog in the background. You can't hear that. Uh, hopefully you can, but um, I'm not sure what he's barking at. Uh, but anyway, so it's the Galapagos fur seal, one in a, in a super duper landslide. Um, so that's who we'll be talking about today. And again, um, thanks for voting twice, everybody. Oh, thanks for that. <laughs> Instagram does not like me apparently right now. Um, so with that, so there is, um, uh, the, so the Galapagos fur seal and the Galapagos sea lion are actually very similar. When I was looking for, for photos to do the two, I was like, okay, wait, is this one actually for seal? Is this one actually? that like uh okay um so they no, they're very they're very similar <laughs> yeah uh so uh someday we'll do the sea lion but right now we're doing the first seal so i will let cats start with their appearance they're so cute and their distribution yeah they are super cute so let's start with their distribution so as you might guess by their name these guys are endemic to the Galapagos Island archipelago. So basically, this is really the only place that they are found. There is one colony that was recently discovered in northern Peru. Mm. And endemic um, means, just for just in case for people who don't know, endemic means that yeah. they're only found there. Like they started there, yeah. they didn't go anywhere else, that, that's just where they're at. That's it. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So yeah, so basically, this is really the one place you're going to find these guys. Um, mostly they are found on the, uh, in the Western Galapagos Islands. Um, so again, this is an archipelago. So there's multiple islands in the Galapagos Island chain. Um, so these guys are mostly found in the Western Islands and um, typically around rocky shores. They seem to like those kind of more rocky areas. They'll use those as like shade um, to escape the sun. So the islands that they are most commonly found are Isla Isabella and Isla Fernandina. Those are the most well-populated. So these are ones that like, if you're gonna go as a tourist to try to see these guys, these are the ones, the islands that you would probably go to. Um, they're rarely seen at sea, which will kind of feed into, I think a little bit about maybe how much we know about these guys, um, that mostly when they are seen, this is on land, um, when they are hauled out and kind of, like I said, they do prefer those more shaded rocky areas when they're on land. The reason for that is due to their appearance. So. Nice little segue. So these guys, as the name would suggest again, they're fur seals. So they do have a pretty thick coat. Um, the males uh, have a slightly longer mane. So again, like a lot of fur seals, it's a little bit thicker hair for the males around that neck area. Um, in terms of coloration, these guys are like a grayish brown coat. Um, as again, they are, uh, they have external ear flaps. So, and they have large bulging eyes, which I just love that description. I thought that was really funny where the like several places I saw like large bulging eyes, like, oh, so they're a little, you know, I don't know, they got big eyes. They're really cute. Oh, Cindy, you're muted. <laughs> you're, you're, Cindy, you're muted. Gosh, dang it. Oh, I was trying to hide it from the dogs when they're making noise. Um, so what's sorry, what were you saying? But the, uh, with the bulging makes me think of that, you know, that lady that's that, like went viral on in the internet where she can actually push her eyeballs out of her sockets. 
Have you not you haven't no. seen it? Oh my oh, god! Yeah, no. she can actually push them out so her like you could see like the ball part of their eye, and so that's what I think of when you say bulging. <laughs> so oh, it's not, no. not a very attractive wanna... name for the fur seals. <laughs> So no, I, like I just like to think of them as having big eyes. Yes. Um, so again, grayish brown fur coat, external ear flaps, and lar large eyes. And they do have a pretty short snout. So this is important. We'll get to why in just a second. Um, and then another really cute descriptor, they have a small button nose. Aww. So very petite, very petite. They are actually, in fact, the smallest of all eared seals. Yes. Um, so they only grow, the males only grow up to about five feet in length. And the females are slightly smaller at around about four to four and a half feet. So like really small. That's the size of like a, like a harbor seal. Yeah. Yeah. That's tiny. Mm -hmm. So very small. Um, the pups are kind of a blackish brown. Sometimes they have white or grayish around the nose and mouth areas. And in terms of coloration for the adults, like I said, they all have this kind of grayish brown coat, but the males have a slightly lighter underside. Um, the females and the juveniles have what they refer to as more of like a rusty to tan colored belly and chest. So again, if you are seeing them in the wild, if it's more of that kind of like reddish undertone to the belly and chest, that's likely a female or juvenile. Um, like I said, it's important to note that they have the shorter snout because these guys are very often confused with the Galapagos sea lions. So kind of funny that, um, and we were talking before we started recording about how interesting it was that you guys were like, no, we want to hear about the fur seal. Um, and they are in a lot of ways, very similar looking to the Galapagos sea lions. So they might be confused with them, but a few important differences. So they are smaller than the Galapagos sea lions in general. They have the shorter, broader head than the Galapagos sea lion. So the Galapagos sea lion has a slightly more narrow, elongated head. Um, and the coat is a lot thicker too. So again, especially if you're seeing them on land, which you're most likely to, the coat is going to be a lot fluffier. And they have larger fore flippers than the sea lion. So if you happen to get a, a view of those four, four flippers, then those are going to be longer than the sea lions also. And, um, oh shoot, I was going to say something about their appearance and how they're different and now completely went out of my brain. Um, <laughs> but there was something about the, their, um, their coat. Oh no, the, the ears, that's it. So I find personally that the fur seals, because fur seals are part of the sea lion group. They're, it's a kind of a misnomer name because they're not actually true seals. They're actually in the Odoriad. So they are sea lion mm. grouping. A little confusing. Um, yeah. But the fur fur seal ears are more cylindrical like I feel like they they look like little tubes more than the eared seals for of, of like sea lions they're just more like flaps um at least that's what I've noticed like on the Guadalupe fur seal the northern fur seal that we have up here and then when I look at their picture as well so I think I think they're more kind of a, they're just a different shape than um regular sea lion ears interesting yeah that's a good good point to make um and that's about it. That's pretty much all I have. So again, like I said, these guys are found really only in the Galapagos Islands, grayish brown for coat. Again, they're pretty small, five to uh, four to five feet in length, depending on the, uh, the gender. And again, the males are going to have that slightly thicker mane. And that's about it. It's kind of funny because it's like, since they're endemic and like, well, oh, that's just where they are. Like most of yeah, the distribution, I, like there's like they're here and they're here and they go this way or whatever. And it's like, no, no, I know this is this is where they are. And I think it's funny too because a lot of times we do spend more time talking about like variations in appearance based on certain subspecies or like certain you know certain areas and whatever. So with these guys, it's pretty straightforward. They're this is what they look like and this is where they are. <laughs> so it's gonna be nice and streamlined. And it, I'll I'll be talking about where they are in like the behavior and stuff. But it's interesting because these are tropical sea lion you know basically in the sea lions family and sea lions are generally not in the tropics so mm -hmm. there's some interesting adaptations that these guys have uh, for living there which is uh, what i'll be talking about so um moving on to then the diet and behavior uh this may be, end up being a shorter episode although we say that a lot and then we end up talking a lot so it may not be but uh there's not quite as much information <laughs> about these guys than um uh, than we have for other species uh, and for kind of relatively good reasons. Um, so for diet, what's really funny is I looked at a, a bunch of different places uh, and I didn't really find, I didn't, I didn't try super hard to find like a detailed diet study, but just, you know, cruising around, they, there wasn't much. It was just that they, um, they eat fish and, and cephalopods. So that's, that's the amount of <laughs> detail I got. 
Um, nice. Yeah, uh, they do. Uh, they are uh, nocturnal feeders, so they do tend to feed at night, and that's due to the um, you know the deep scattering layer type thing. So the, the prey is coming up closer to the um, to the surface at night, so they don't have to dive as far. So their average dive is only about ten to thirty meters. So a lot of a lot of sea lions can dive pretty deep, but those are also much larger animals. So I think the smaller you are, the, it's a little bit harder to dive as long. That's what I was gonna say. Yeah, they might be kind of a little more restricted by their size. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but they do spend a lot of time at sea. Their foraging trips can last about 16 hours. So they're like, wow. you know, I'm gone for a while. See you later. Yeah. Um, so that's like the whole night, like, like mm -hmm. more than a whole night. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. So they, they tend to spend a lot of time out there. Um, and like other, uh, uh, uh other, some of the other, uh, otoriads, um, they do spend a lot of time in the, uh, in the ocean versus land, but I'll talk about that more in a minute with the behavior. Um, I did find that they have two sounds that they know about when they're foraging, and it's a lengthened growl or a snap or knocking noise. And yeah. they don't know what it's for, but they do think it's for helping with foraging um, and not communication. So interesting. Okay. Huh. Curious. Uh, so I wonder if they're almost using like a like a like a fish stun type noise. Maybe? Yeah. Or like just corralling like fish them. scare noise. Yeah. Right. Yeah. For like the knocking noise. Interesting. Mm -hmm. But Very I think cool. they they're you know they're out and about and out so long like there's I don't think there's been that much like following fur seals out into the water and seeing what they eat. So that's what I was gonna say, and that's kind of what I was alluding to. They are these guys are a little more elusive, I think, and so mm -hmm. it can be challenging to. I'm not. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how much we actually do know about them for that reason. Yeah, and 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 I'll talk about it in a minute, but like they're elusive in that way. But then more, you're more likely to see them than Galapagos sea lions because the fur seals spend a little bit more time on land than others do, okay. which is interesting. So I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. Um. Yeah. But the last thing about their diet was was actually quite interesting is that it is influenced by lunar cycles very strongly. So they will um, forage longer during the new moon than during a full moon. And if you think about one thing, in the full moon, there's more light. So you're going to be easier seen by sharks and other predators. Um, and then also the prey may be in deeper water because of uh, the way they're following um, the, uh, the, the, the those light patterns. They're not going to come up uh, during the full moon as much as they do in the new moon when it's darker and other predators should see them as well. Wow, interesting. I wonder, does that also, would it also have to do with like, I know for certain fish species, they have um, kind of those lunar cycles as well, like with their, with their own cycling. So like with what they're feeding on or like how they're reproducing and things like that. Like, I wonder if it has to do with that as well. Yeah, I think that's what it is. I think it's basically they're, they're, they're influenced by the lunar cycles because their prey is influenced by the lunar cycle for the most part. I mean, again, so cool. being hidden by it from sharks and stuff is also better as well as a bonus, but I would think the driver would have been that the prey are doing that because of whatever bonuses they get from it. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. cool. Yeah. Um, cause lots of times you'll see like, yeah, there's some co co correlation with lunar cycles or whatever, but this seems pretty, pretty strongly uh, influenced by that. Yeah. Um, nice. maybe, they're maybe they're vampires. <laughs> <laughs> Werewolves, right? Where for exactly. seals. Yeah. There you go. Um, so, uh, so in the behavior, the, there was, I like this one website was like, the, the, they're odd uh, sea lion, you know, odd odoriads because of these two things. First of all, that they're non-migratory. So a lot of odoriads will move back and forth between um, rookeries or actually migrate, you know, this way or that way. Um, so these are, you know, they stay in one place. So that's unique. Um, and it's the only one that lives and gives birth in a mainly tropical environment, which we mentioned already. So um they're the 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 hot tropic sea um for seals <laughs> sea lions um and the other one is the large amount of time on land compared to other odoriates so they spend 30 percent of time on land and you may not think that that's very long but in comparison to other sea lion species um that is a fair amount of time and so that's why they are more you're more likely to see them versus galapagos sea lions when they're on land they're on land for longer but then they're still on they're still in the water 70 percent of the time so it's like you won't see them but then when you could see them you're more likely to see them than other species because they hang out longer right interesting um, yeah and i'm curious too so i wonder like again if that's more to do with their size 
like they just can't be out in the water for quite as long because I mean there's there's a lot that I was reading with the appearance in terms of how they basically have to mitigate not getting too hot because again yeah, like you so said, they're they, in the yeah tropics. they avoid heat by, by they avoid the heat of the sun by like you said lying in the shade next to boulders under lava ledges and caves and making trips to the mm-hmm. sea so but I don't think this I don't think the Galapagos sea lions are that much bigger and yeah, I don't know how much time they spend on land but like but they have more mm-hmm. fur right so they're they have a thicker coat than the sea lions do so perhaps yeah. that's part of it. So it's a, a balance. Yeah. So, interesting. Yeah. So it's it's kind of interesting because it's like, yeah, well, okay, if you're so hot, why do you spend more time on that? <laughs> and then you have to find yeah. these behaviors to go about to avoiding that. So yeah, it's interesting. interesting. But they really like where they live. So that's what they're doing. Uh, um, and so when they're on land, um, they are in large groups. Uh, and, uh, you know, most of this time is going to be around. Um, Mate, uh, mating and breeding, right? That's the general thing for pinnipeds <clears throat> that have these kind of uh, large grouping and mating on land. Um, so the males have territories that can be up to 200 square meters. So it's pretty big. Um, and yeah. with as many as six to 10 females. And they'll do that for about a month. And so we've talked about this before in other podcasts, but you know, when the males are doing this, they're not eating. And when the females are giving birth, they're not eating for a bit. These guys are a little different, but um but the males are basically holding that territory down for a month without eating. So they've got a, um, it, there's a lot of risk there. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. It's very interesting. Um, so, but, so then um, do, I was going to go to the um, the females. Um, I'm going to s- segue into the females here real quick and then go back to the cool part about the males. Um, so in those territories, they, 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 um, breed that's between August and November, which is the cool season in that, uh, region. So again, because they're fur seals and they get hot, they like to do this during the cool season, which is opposite of most other things that usually do it in the warm season. Cause babies, I'm just going to say, yeah, <laughs> babies need warm. So these guys are the opposite. Um, so they resume their estrus about five to 10 days after birth or after they resume foraging trips. So they'll um, basically spend a, kind of a week or so with their pups and then go start going back for foraging trips because these guys are different than a lot of the, um, even some other sea lions um, and seals, of course, in that they will, they have one of the longer um, uh, uh, lactations. So a lot of times it's a couple months or you know maybe only a month. Um, these guys will nurse for uh, up to two to three years. Yeah. I had to unmute myself. I'm like, wait, what? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, the pups can go in the ocean at six months. They find their own food at 12 months, but they will still nurse like needing that nursing for two to three years until they, that become... is wild. Mm-hmm. And I'll get to a minute. This, the thing that I was going to talk about with the males and this is linked to these environmental factors that are the issue. So um, when when the females go back, they will forage, um, usually do one to four day foraging trips and then staying on shore for about a day with a pup, depending on um, food and stuff. But what's interesting is that, so they'll resume estrus even after the, they have a pup, they'll resume estrus that five to 10 days after, but they won't get pregnant until that pup is weaned. Wow. Because it's really um, bad for the, it, it's called sibling rivalry, where if they have two, then Oftentimes the sibling, the older sibling will kill the younger one or the younger one will just die because the older one takes all the food. So they really oh, can't wow. have that overlap at all. So they just don't. That's fa- that Okay. That makes a lot of sense too. When we get to the threats, um, this'll, this'll make a little bit more sense. Wow. I have no idea. That's crazy. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And so then, um, uh, and so that this longer lactation is linked to, um, is uh, linked to these environmental conditions like El Nino events, because that long lactation allows them to buffer. If there's bad times, there's still time to do mm-hmm. that. And then not having, not getting pregnant while you're still nursing one allows you to, to make sure the one survives. Um, so it's basically so- like you're literally putting kind of all of your eggs in one basket and really nurturing that pup to give them the best possible chance before investing in a new pup. Okay. Right. And because the environmental conditions are so variable in that area, which I think is what yeah, you're we'll talking about, and what I'm going to talk yeah. about in a second too. Um, that's, that's their, their, the evolution of the adaptation that they have to that. And so, uh, and they do see longer lactation when food is scarce. 
So they'll just mm, okay. keep it going because the baby's not going to find enough food. So she can still get, she can get it. She can get the milk to them. You know, that kind of thing. So for the males, which is, this is fascinating. So due to environmental factors, which we, kind of what we just talked about, this variability, and especially with um, uh, uh, food going up and down in this area, um, they're not very efficient at protecting females in their territory, unlike other sea lions. And so it is very common that other males are able to successfully meet on a rival male's, male's territory, hmm. which normally, like they're sneaky males, right? The, that's a thing. But normally it's like, it's a small percentage, but I think with these guys, it's much more common. Um, Interesting. And so this is fascinating. So the, the those environmental factors where you have these, this, the, in that area, you have more fluctuations in good years and bad years of food availability and things like that. And lots of this has to do with El Nino, right? So this, the oscillations in um, every couple of years really, um, um, really have a, a, an impact on the, the, the ecosystem and the food web there. So due to the El Nino event of 1982, Adult territorial oh, yeah. males were driven to nearly 100% mortality because of food supply. Like, yeah, they, yeah we'll they talk more about that in the threats. Yeah, yeah, they couldn't they couldn't last the month that they needed to to defend their territory because they didn't have enough food to survive it, which is just crazy. Yeah, and then it's an, a pretty another, risky strategy. Yeah, and an, another um, another paper said 30% of the adults and almost all the seals under the age of four died. Like that's yeah. huge. So if you have these big crashes, like that makes sense that you are going to nurture that one pup and make sure that it lasts longer and that you can make sure that they survive through these fluctuations that happen. El Nino and, and La Nina years, they fluctuate every few years. So you're going to get these ups and downs. Um, so it's very interesting to see that evolved in their behaviors to adapt to that since they want, since they want to stay in this crazy place. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And yeah, like I said, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the threats. Cause that is actually one of the main ones for these guys is really yeah. just that environmental variability. Yeah. Well, and the, I mean that huge, crap. I mean, well, so for, yeah. And then you'll talk about threats because they're fur seals. So obviously there's, there was some hunting there they're and then they have threats. these, yeah. like these other, they have continually these large population crashes that are going to be an issue for long-term survival. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they, uh, the other thing I had was that they communicate with vocalizations and through visual displays, which is pretty, pretty common. Um, did, did you have something, do you have anything on predators for the threat section? I mean, I have that they, they, yes, I have a few predators listed here. Okay. Well, I have one that I wasn't, you probably found, but it's an interesting one. So I, uh, I'll wait and pop that in if you don't talk about it then. Okay. We'll talk about that in the threats. Um, okay. So last thing, um, the females are sexually mature at three to five and the males are sexually mature at seven to 10. And that's pretty common because if you are, if you are a territorial species, ter well, territorial species where the males have to fight other males for that territory and defend it you have to be bigger before you can basically do that so it takes a little bit longer um i'm just going to throw the lifespan out here real quick because i thought it was funny um they, they they didn't say it in years at first they're like the normal lifespan is 264 months and i was like wow <laughs> that's like we always talk as parents, we always talk like you, you first when your babies, it's like, oh, my baby's one month, six months. And then after two, you're like, okay, now it's just years. But we always right. joke, like, what if we did that for humans? Like, well, I'm 452 months old. <laughs> <laughs> Why did they give it in months? I don't understand. But it makes that evens up to 22 years. It's okay. okay. I was going to say, because I saw a couple that were like very wide ranging lifespan. So I was like, I'm curious what you found. Cause I think the one that I found was like, one said like 10 years. And then the other one said like 24. And I was like, I'm guessing this is somewhere in here in the middle, somewhere but right. if they're only sexually mature at like seven to 10, then I would guess, yeah, it's closer it's to gonna be a little bit longer. Cause if they're waiting till 10 and they die at 10, well, that's not, they're not going to survive. That's pointless. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I think most, most pinniped species are 20 to 30 years. Like that's pretty yeah. average. It seems pretty standard. Um, I did find that they sweat when they get too hot. Mm -hmm. You know, which yeah, a lot of those makes sense. Do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good adaptation. Yep. Uh, and they do a similar thing with like other odoriads where they use the countercurrent exchange system and the flippers to heat up or cool down as needed. But um, yeah, that's what I found. So they're very, very tightly tied to the environmental factors in that area, where the lunar cycles or um, oscillations in weather over years um to su be successful in this hot tropical environment with their giant fur coats so <laughs> um 
um, with that, we will then we will uh, take a quick break and get back with uh, learning more about that those kind of threats uh, and then some interesting new research that I was able to dig up. So we will be right. And we are back. All right. So tell us what's going to kill all these animals. <laughs> I know. I always get the. I always get to share the best parts. Okay. So, um, in terms of their overall status, let's start there. So these guys are um, listed by the IUCN Red List as endangered. The uh, the estimated population number is about between ten to fifteen thousand. So pretty low. Um, again, unfortunately, based on their very restricted location um that kind of makes sense right they don't really have the capacity to spread out around the globe like some other species that we've talked about um so yeah we're looking at about 10 to 15,000 individuals as far as we know um they are currently protected under ecuadorian law um and the and i'll talk about a little bit more about that in just a second and also the special law of the national park and galapagos marine reserve so again there is some protection afforded to these guys which is fantastic and I have some, in, uh, one of the research thing is about the reserve and how well it's working, so. Oh, fascinating. Okay, perfect. That'll be really interesting. Okay, cool. Um, so why do we need this protection for these guys? Let's talk about it. So getting into the threats, um, as we alluded to, these guys have a fur coat. And if you have listened to any of our other podcasts, you will know that fur coats likely make them very attractive to people um, who want their pelts. So that was, of course, the, the same situation, unfortunately, for these guys. So their populations were honestly decimated in the 1800s. Um, again, that was when the you know, exploration was much more popular. People were able to access these islands all of a sudden that hadn't been able to get to them for a very long time just with their travel of capabilities. Um, and by the early 1900s, the Galapagos fur seals were thought to be fully extinct. Um, so, I mean, it was to that point that they thought that they were completely gone, that they'd been hunted out. Ironically, it may also be due to their fur that they survived because they prefer those shaded areas like caves and, and crevices um, because they get too hot and they hunt at night. They're actually, they think that that might actually have helped them to survive a little bit more because they were not around when the, the hunters were present. And we talked about another seal, <clears throat> uh, a species that did that, not necessarily in the exact same way, but they, they re oh, was it the monk? It wasn't, wasn't it the, the monk seals that they did? it was the, the monk caves. seal. Right, yeah, so they started mm -hmm. this kind of risky thing where they're going in these caves where sometimes the pup dies because the water comes in, but that's where they were hiding from all the people and that allowed them to survive, so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I don't know if for these guys, if that was a learned behavior, but it, so it sounds like it's more of like, again, that kind of thermoregulation process, but that may actually have really helped them because they were harder to find. Um, it's a nice, it's a nice so, benefit to the natural behavior. I know, exactly. Um, so because of that massive hunting effort, they, they were um, in, I believe hunting was finally prohibited by Ecuadorian law in 1934. Um, and then again, that additional protection was introduced in 1959 when the Galapagos National Park was established. So there are provisions in place for them to no longer be hunted for their pelts, which is fantastic. There is still some concern around um, human impact with tourism and things like that. And then some more sort of secondary effects of human impact a little bit. Um, but there's not, no longer really that risk of direct hunting for, for their fur. And I have to, I've, I've heard from other people who have gone to the Galapagos and who um, have, have you know, been there, like, it's pretty tight. Like, they do a better job with regulation there than a lot of other places around the world. So that's yeah. something that's benefits the animals there, for sure. Yeah, that's encouraging. Awesome. Um, yeah, we talked a little bit about predation earlier. Um, so they are occasional prey to killer whales and sharks, but the most prominent predator is actually feral dogs. I thought islands. that was crazy. I was like, wait, what? How, how did dogs yeah. get there in the first place? Like, why? Is right? There? People. Well, people true. bringing their dogs and then their, I mean, it's just, it's, it's the same thing as again, when people were coming there with their ships, you know, it's the same way as rats get onto islands that were not able to get there and cats get onto islands that weren't able to get there. So I really didn't know that. I wasn't aware that feral dogs were a big problem, but apparently that is like, that's the biggest risk of predation for these guys is being killed. And again, they're small, right? So, yeah. I mean, it's, it, we, they're probably the same size as some of those dogs. 
Yeah. I was, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. Like you would think that in a place where there's, you're close to humans or I mean, you're close to humans there, but like, it's gotta, gotta work to get there. It's not like just like on the shores of California, you know? <laughs> but I think, I mean, I think a lot of us have this possibly naive perception of the Galapagos Islands as being this very unspoiled like it's just how it was when Darwin discovered them you know or like when we went, didn't discover but when Darwin went there you know um I, I don't think it's like that to be quite honest um so yeah I didn't I didn't realize that was an issue but apparently that's actually a pretty big concern for these guys and I would imagine a lot of the other um phocid and, and pinniped species there as well um in those areas so uh, the other human related one that I have here is plastics. So again, like a lot of other podcasts, um, these guys are at pretty big risk for marine plastic and debris. Again, this can either be through direct entanglement, ingestion, which I think is becoming more and more of an issue, especially as animals that, that you know, are spending a lot of time in the ocean are feeding on fish. Um, so they're, they're grabbing things that they perceived to be fish, which are in fact plastics. Um, and then of course, microplastics becoming more and more of a concern as well, building up in their system. So this is something even again, and this is what we consider or think about as kind of an unspoiled, untouched region. Um, this is still impacting these animals. And I saw on several different websites has been listed as, as more and more of a concern. So I think this is something potentially just with the ocean currents there too, they might be more prone to getting plastics washed in there. Um, but yeah, something to consider. And it's such a good point of that, again, back to your point of like, we think of the Galapagos as this untainted, wonderful place that's away from everything that's untouched, but it isn't, you know, like plastics are there all too, connected. just like they're here, the woods, one ocean, those currents are going to bring it over there too. So it's a good reminder that like, if it happens there, if it ha you know, like it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Um, next threat, again, we already talked a little bit, but let's talk a little bit more about that climate, um, climate change and climate cycling. So again, these guys are at risk of climate change and ocean warming, um, for all of the same reasons that we already talked about, right? So that's going to impact their food supplies. It's going to increase the sea surface temperature. It's going to potentially increase it or shift the weather patterns, which is, is already a little bit unstable for them in the first place. Um, but the, the second one are these natural um, climate cycles through El Nino and La Nina years. So specifically El Nino cycles, these guys are very, very susceptible to because of that um, ocean warming during that process. Um, so again, this is going to reduce the food avail availability, um, increase risk of starvation. This is also potentially, again, going to have knock-on effects to how they thermoregulate, whether or not they can actually get cool enough during the day. And that's, you know, that has kind of a secondary impact on their um, their overall well-being and their immune function, all of those things and their energy levels. It's like um, work in the summer. Like if you, if you keep that right. on, you're going to overheat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, heat stroke is a real concern, right? So if you can't get, if you can't cool off efficiently enough, and if you're not getting the right amount of food because your food is being impacted by the sea, sea temperatures changing as well, no bueno. Um, so yeah, like Cindy said, I mean, the, the biggest crash they've, they've had to date that was recorded was that 1982 to 1983 cycle where almost all of the young fur seals were killed, um, along with about 30% of those adult females and non-territorial males and almost a hundred percent of the large territorial males. So like a huge, and this is, remember, this is like about almost, you know, probably, you know, 50 to 70 years after that massive crash due to the hunting. So they'd only kind of just started to come back up and they were just starting to get a foothold and then a huge, like literally almost a full population crash. Absolutely crazy. Um, and so again, these are these are natural cycling events. These are not necessarily impacted by climate change, although they are interacting with climate change. Um, and so some of these cycles can become more extreme with, with um, in global warming and global climate change in general as well. So pretty intense location to to choose to <laughs> subsist in yeah, it's pretty it's pretty uh kind of risky like they oh and so this i wanted to, to point out is you know like in the tropics it is kind of oligotrophic which means like there's not a lot of nutrients there but in certain places there's this upwelling occurrence that that occurs and this is one of those where there's this it's it actually is quite highly productive which is why these animals can survive there because of that location but those are susceptible to the changes in weather, those, those El Nino and La Nina oscillations that change that dynamic 
And so then you get these fluctuations in, in the year. So like they're in a not nutrient rich place, but has a nutrient rich pocket that then gets shifted depending on the weather. So it's really very, so yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very dicey place to live, especially in a warm place with a parka on. So I'm not, yeah. Really I know. I'm very, I'm very impressed that these guys have managed to persist as long as they have. Yeah. Um, the final threat that I will say kind of relates to that a little bit nicely, actually, which is really just the threat of being a closed population, right? So because they have, they have experienced some of these massive drops in population, which we refer to as biologists as a population bottleneck, right? Where you're, you, the population declines to where there's very few individuals left, and then they breed amongst themselves, and then the population recovers. That has inherent risks with it as well in terms of um, recessive genes becoming more dominant and, and just in terms of like overall fitness level for the animals. Um, so again, this limited range, low population size may make them more susceptible to things like disease outbreaks or inbreeding um, and just those other issues that do come with living in such a limited location with a low population size. So just something to kind of bear in mind, that's kind of just a background threat for these guys all the time, just because of their lifestyle and where they live um, and these massive population depressions that they've experienced. Yeah, the 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 hallmark of biology is genetic variation is good. Genetic variation is good because it allows there to be options of animals that can survive in different as as things change. Um, and then there also is the thing of inbreeding, right? So if you have that mm -hmm. that genetic bottleneck, you're breeding with your your family members basically. Um, the one thing that I'll say that is uh, interesting about that is that it doesn't always mean a death sentence. So sometimes it does. Sometimes you have bad genes and then all you have is bad genes and you're basically, that's it. Like you're, just, you're done. But for some, some populations that have been inbred basically for so long, and I'm specifically talking about the vaquita in um, the Gulf of California. Uh, and they're even, you know, talking about that with the Southern resident killer whales up here. If you have been inbred for long enough that the genetic variation is already low, you've already filtered out all the bad genes. And so the genetic mm -hmm. variation is not necessarily going to be an issue for your long-term survival. If you don't have genes that allow you to change with the environment, then that might that's a different story. But the, the bad deleterious genes that get caught and stay in a, in a small population that then hurt the population... Um, if those aren't there, then the, that that portion of the genetic issue isn't, isn't there. So hopefully that's that's true for them. I don't know if it is, but yeah, I mean that's a really I, good point, though. Yeah, I feel like it is after so many population crashes that if they're still around. I was going to say <laughs> these guys have some kind of inbuilt safety mechanism. It feels like that they can survive. Yeah. I mean, and again, that's the interesting thing if they're if they're navigating and, and coexisting with these massive climate cycles. Um, they've got to have something that would, that would allow them to perpetuate and to continue to survive through that. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, for the new research, uh, a lot of it actually does maybe link to climate change. Um, so I'm actually going to, I'm actually going to start with that and then I'll give you the other ones. Um, but I started with one and then I'm like, and I found two more and I was like, okay, well, I guess I talk briefly about all of these. Um, but the first one is uh, Paez Rosas et al. at 2017. This was the northernmost record on Pacific coast of North and South America. It was a 2016 subadult male sighted in, for, uh, was it an e Erendira beach in Lazaro, Cardenas, Mecoacan, Mexico. <laughs> so basically Mexico. I don't know. <laughs> they had like three different locations. Um, but that was the farthest north as it had ever been seen. And this may be related to anomalous temperatures in the Pacific at the end of 2015 and 2016, which decreases the primary productivity, forcing the animal to travel farther to find food, right? So that very oh, interesting. And there was unusually high frequency of strandings of marine mammals at the same time, cetaceans and yeah. um, so that might interesting. be that. Yeah. So then I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Oh, wait, there's another one. Quintana Rizzo et al. 2017 was the first fur seal seen in Guatemala. So in June 2016, same similar time, again, a live fur seal stranded subadult male. See the trend going here. Um, and that's the first record in the Pacific coast of Guatemala and in the Central America region. And then um, Tamayo Milan et al. Um, had the molecular ID of the first fur seal on the central coast of o Oaxaca, Oaxaca in Mexico. Is that right? Oh, uh, Mexico. <laughs> I think so. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's a Waka. Yeah. Waka. Um, this was made 2019. It was a yearling. So again, young. Um, mm -hmm. There were four occasions that were cited. One was injured. That was taken in. 
And apparently juvenile fur seals uh, are just really hard to tell the difference between the, them in just by looking at them. Um, it's harder as juveniles to do that. So they took molecular, they, they looked at the genes. Um, and it did say that it was a, an actual uh, Galapagos fur seal. And that may be related to the high sea surface temperatures associated with an El Nino year. Again, so mm. these walkabouts that these young males are doing it, are likely because of of these oscillations and then also which can then intercorrelate with climate change. Um, and if climate change happens more and more, then these guys are gonna probably start stretching out where they're going because of just the food collapses that happen. Um, so definitely, definitely a risk if we're seeing these changes happening, these males wandering about the, <laughs> the ocean. The ocean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then uh, the other one was, uh, I found Lopez et al. 2015. This is looking at the matrilineal population structure. So they looked at mitochondrial DNA, which you inherit from your mother, uh, and then microsatellites on the nuclear DNA, which comes from um, both. And uh, they found similar levels of genetic diversity to other pinniped species, which is interesting since we were just talking about that genetic bottleneck, um, despite the severe exploitation and population crashes from El Nino. So they they basically wow. have kept the genetic diversity similar to other pinniped species, even though yeah. all that happened. That's wild. Yeah. So I don't know, I guess the the quote unquote right ones died that had the, the, the same genes. So that just kept the ones that had the different genes. I don't know. Oh, that's that's really interesting though. Yeah. So I don't know what they've got going mm. on in the genes, but it's it's pretty good. Um, they did find that there was strong fine scale matrilineal population structure. So 33.9% of the variation in the mitochondrial DNA um, was basically partitioned among the colonies that were within 70 kilometers from each other. So they're all right there. Like they're not going far. Um, and so that translates into this fine scale genetic population structure that we've been talking about. Um, the natal philopatry, which means basically you stay where you were born, um, of the females translates into this fine scale population structure um, in this highly mobile species. Like they can go wherever they want. <laughs> and males do. Males take longer trips and go to places. Um, but it is very much restrained by the females to the, that, the area that they're in. Hmm. I guess maybe that helps a little bit if the females are not traveling around as much, you're not mixing, like the males are really creating that genetic diversity by moving around, but the females are staying put. So they're not, they're not moving and intermingling with other females as well. You know what I'm saying? Whereas yeah. like, if you have that more fine scale, I can, I could see why that might maintain a little bit more diversity potentially. Well, and it would be different if the males were staying too, because then there would be Correct. More, like the diversity would be, yeah. would decrease or it should. Yeah. Maybe yeah. That is there. interesting. Yeah. So at least you got one, one of the sides going out and mixing the genes. It's important. Um, so Chavez et al. in 2022 uh, did uh, another population genetics and looking at phylogeography, right? So how they are related to the geography area. They looked at rook rookeries on four islands. So there were nine total rookeries. And they found three clusters with asymmetric gene, gene flow. So um, basically there's some there was some flow in between them but the other ones like nope like these are just they just stay within here so again kind of going to that like they do mix up but not a lot either so i don't know what's going on with these guys they're kind of magic how interesting yeah so they found marked structuring of the populations are likely due to interplay between long-term site fidelity and long distance migration in both males and female individuals probably influenced by varying degrees of marine productivity so the thing that may be hurting them may also be helping them and pushing them to go out and spread those genes in different ways. Mm, how, in, okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it's like, it's not good for you, but also good for you <laughs> in terms of population genetics. It's the, it's the balance, right? Right. The risky, exactly. the risky strategy. Yep. Well, and then you want to keep, you know, if you're in a certain area and that's really working for you, you want to keep the genes there, right? So the females are keeping maybe those good ones that are like, I know how to survive on this island. And the males are moving around and mixing up some of the right, other introducing things. more variation. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Fascinating. So, totally. Um, the uh, this is uh, Rio Frio Lazo and Paez Rosas et al. 2021. Um, Galapagos sea lions and fur seals adapted to a variable world. So this is talking about both species. But they live in the tropics with that high environmental variability in oceanic disturbances equals unpredictable marine productivity, which is what we've been talking about this entire time, right? 
they, um, they, in order to live there, they have reduced the overall body size and energy requirements. That's probably why they're small. Um, the limited food supply means they have longer lactations than most other species, um, uh, otorias at least. Um, the trophic specialization, they have, um, they, they're, they, they don't, they, they have, they're pretty specialized, the sea lions versus the fur seals. So they don't overlap too much, um, but they have a high level of flexibility um, so that reduces the interspecific competition. And then combine that with prey switching during during El Nino events. So they're flexible, right? They're plastic. They can be like, oh, there's the, my regular species isn't here because of the stupid El Nino. I'll eat these other things. But they're both flexible and they both do it in ways so that they don't compete. Yes. Yes, I know, right? Like, I know they're not thinking about this necessarily, but it's genius. No, but that, I mean, that makes sense. Like, right, finding that balance so that you yeah. can both coexist in that pretty pretty challenging environment yeah that's like really well, cool. we, can, we can work together by not working together yeah <laughs> <I'll survive. laughs> we can coexist exactly um and so the moms adjust their length of foraging belts in response to the fluctuations in food which i kind of mentioned earlier um and this is just a, a, a very a basically we've talked about all these points but this paper was was kind of summing them all up i mean like the natural climatic variation of the ecosystem is an important stress factor on their populations, which drives that evolved behavior that they have, which is just, it's really neat to just see that kind of like, yep, yeah, that's, yep, yeah, that's what's happening. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's, again, that's kind of what a lot of us associate with the Galapagos, right? Is these very interesting case studies where you can see very, a lot more clearly than in certain other species, what's creating those drivers, what is actually the the main impact or the main stressor that's, that's pushing this. So yeah, really interesting. Exactly. And so the last one I have is going back to the marine reserves. Mm, and so this yeah. is Ventura et al. 2019. And it says minimal overlap with conservation zone of marine reserve and fur seals. So the Galapagos is protected um, under the Galapagos Marine Reserve, right? So the, and they recently redefined the zones within the reserve. So there's a large reserve. So they're all the, they're, 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 um, populations uh, are within that reserve, but within there, there are zones that you can do different things in. So some you can fish, some you can do that, you're right, there's some you can't go at all, some you can do this. So it's really important that the zones that you're trying to protect the first seals in have the right protections, right? So what they did is they went through to look at kernel distributions and habitat modeling from tracking data that they had um, from over, um, over two years and three different environmental scenarios. So they looked at it during a cold year, during a warm year, and during an El Nino year. Um, uh, or like cold like cold season, warm season, El Nino year, that kind of thing. Um, they identified hotspots of pinniped usage and ID'd, um, uh, and then looked at the predictions of what good habitat patches would be for these animals. So where are they going? Okay, that's where they like to go. These are good habitat patches. This is in this location where those habitat patches are that should be protected. Um, and so they used uh, use those together to do a spatial prioritization analysis to define the areas of high conservation priority and then overlap those with the marine reserve and the zones that were recently redefined and recalculated. Interestingly, they found fur seals used mostly offshore deep waters and more heterogeneous, heterogeneous space usage compared to the sea lion. So they were more varied in what they did versus the global sea lion. The three key areas of high conservation priority um, that they identified through this analysis were all within the, the marine reserve, great, step one, but they overlapped only 8% with the conservation zones. Interesting. So the largest proportion of the key pinniped foraging habitat in the Western archipelago will not be protected from licensed activities in the sustainable use zone, particularly fishing and boat traffic. Wow. So it, this this is I thought this was a great example of something that great is being done, but not correctly. Right? They have a reserve. They are trying to protect it. They're doing these zones so that humans can still use areas, but still protect animals. But they're not. It's not right. It's the they they have not protected the right spots for the fur seals because you know and maybe they didn't have the data that this paper now did. Maybe that's changed since now. That was 2019, so that's you know five years ago. Hopefully they've used this data to maybe redefine the zones again. I didn't see any other papers, you know, updating it. Um, but it's it just so shows the importance of research for conservation 
and you can do something great and have it not be effective yeah. because you're not doing having the right data and doing the right things even though you're and i think also just really highlights how important it is to be looking at the ecosystem yeah. right you know especially when you're talking about any kind of management conservation like what is the ecosystem that these animals need that they're dependent on that they're interacting with the most frequently um yeah wow that's really that's really interesting yeah so i mean eight percent that's not gonna mm. do anything. like so you're spending all this money to do this reserve and have these zones and then you're not actually effectively doing like again biologically meaningful measures right that is a great symbol a symbolic gender, gesture of protection but it's not biologically meaningful for the animals and therefore is not doing what you're actually wanting it to do yeah so, wow yeah so, that was very mm. interesting. So these guys are uh, just a, a little enigmas, a nuggets of interesting weirdness. Living They're super cute. Tropics. Go go check them out if you haven't yeah. already Googled them or if you're not watching this on YouTube. Go it's check so it. They cute. are they are genuinely really cute. They are very cute. And look at this the store oh, nose and little ears. The button nose. The button nose. Button nose. Button nose. Um, so with that, we will, we will leave you, um, with our lovely fur seals, uh, Galapagos fur seals. And I'm, I'm sure eventually we'll get to the Galapagos sea lion, um, which will probably have very similar information, but different because they're obvious there, there are different than these fur seals. Um, but really interesting interplay. So, uh, with that, we will leave you, uh, for the next episode, we will be going back to either a general review or a topic. We're not sure. So if you have something that you want us to talk about, that's, um, recent and interesting, please show it, um, email us or put it on our social media channels. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Um, don't forget to go to our new website and look at the merch store and uh, we have um, more options, um, hoodies and things like that for that. Uh, and if you feel like you'd like to donate, please do so. Uh, that is very helpful for us to keep. We're a small nonprofit, so all the funds go back to our research and helping uh, us teach all the interns that we have coming through and involving the community in our, with our volunteer program and getting the research done that is important for helping the harbor corpuses and harbor seals here in the Sailor Sea. So um, with that, I think that covers everything and um, hope to hear from you so that you can tell us what we wanna talk about. Otherwise we'll find something cool and we will talk with you yeah. next time. <laughs> Sounds good, Bye. see you later. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. To learn more about the species we discuss, check out our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.